and welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Have you ever worried about food allergies? When you eat food, does it make you have a runny nose? Do your lips swell? Does it make you have problems with your stomach? Do you get diarrhea? Do you break out in a rash? You just don't feel good losing your energy? Think it's food allergies or think it's foods? We'll be spending most of this show talking about food allergies. My guest is Dr. Megan Stauffer. Dr. Stauffer is a board certified allergist and she answers these questions every day. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on the Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be talking about what happens to the heart during a heart attack and after the heart attack. And if we can, how do we get rid of that middle-aged tummy or that tummy in our 20s or that tummy in our 60s? You'll want to stay tuned. A lot of information for you. We're talking with Dr. Megan Stauffer, board certified allergist, and we're talking about food allergies. Megan, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you for having me. How common are food allergies? Um, well, they're not really that common. About 5% of kids under 18 and about 4% of adults have food allergies. It has, however, increased significantly in the last uh, 15 years or so. There's been about a 20% increase. So it is more common today than it used to be, you know, even 15, 20 years ago. Is it because we're more aware or people are actually becoming more allergic? I think they're actually becoming more allergic. There's lots of studies out there about that, but most of the studies do show that there is just more food allergy. More common in adults or more common in children? It tends say? to be more common in kids, um, about 5% of kids are affected. What are the, some symptoms of a severe allergic reaction that somebody may have? Yeah, severe, I mean, could even include death. Unfortunately, 150 to 200 deaths um, occur per year due to food allergies. So, so that it would be obviously the most severe So does reaction. somebody go into shock or does their yeah. throat swell or it do could they be, wheeze? What it could be any of those. So symptoms of food allergy include, um, you know, hives, uh, swelling of the lips, tongue, throat even, um, wheezing, coughing, and then yes, they can lose their blood pressure. How does a person suspect food allergies? Well, usually it's symptoms within a good period of time after ingesting a food. So, for instance, with a peanut, typically within 30 minutes to as late as two hours afterwards, they'll start to have the symptoms I described, the hives, the, the swelling, and so forth. Peanut so. allergy, very common? It is. It's, I mean, for a food allergy, it is one of the more common food allergies and unfortunately tends to be the most severe. So if it's the most severe, people will die from that during yeah, the year? Yeah, unfortunately, that's true. Now, I've heard as many as 50 people a year yeah, will die yeah. with peanut allergies. Yes, yes, it is. And there are some new laws coming in place, too, about having peanut, you know, access to epinephrine in school because that does happen. Um, tell me about symptoms that people could have that they think might be allergy, the difference between food allergy and food sensitivity. Yeah, I talk about that a lot in my clinic. Um, so food allergy tends to be, you know, immediate onset of symptoms like I described, um, and it's mediated, it's caused by an allergic antibody to the food. Um, food sensitivity is pretty much any other symptom of, uh, after, that you can have after eating food. So it can be, you know, with milk, a lot of people can have a lactose intolerance where the milk sugar isn't broken down like it should and be in the intestines and you'll get bloating, you know, nausea, diarrhea, those sorts of things. And that would be a food sensitivity. That would be a sensitivity. And, and the I other one we hear about a lot is gluten um, and it can cause some of those same symptoms. If fatigue. somebody has a gluten intolerance, uh, are they allergic to gluten or is that another sensitivity? Yeah, it's, it's another. The intolerance really represents a sensitivity. Um, and you can be allergic to wheat though, and we do have some wheat allergic patients. Their symptoms though typically are the ones like I described before, which would be 90% are going to have hives, you know, um, swelling, coughing, wheezing. You can have vomiting and diarrhea, uh, but for the most part it's, um, you know, with the intolerance it's going to be more limited to the fatigue and so forth. So. Somebody has hives, these are itching welts that they have and they think uh, it may be due to food allergy. How can you tell? Well, really it's important 
for an allergist to get a good history of what happened and what the specific food is that they have in question. So, you know, I will ask patients, you know, what food is it that you suspect and how long after eating that food do you develop symptoms? What are those symptoms, you know, specifically? Um, what treatment do you require when you have the reaction? What medications do you take or what, or do you end up having to go see a doctor or go to the emergency room? Um, so it really, the most important starting point with diagnosing is history. So it can be very, very complicated and you have to take a thorough history and you know, the doctor yes. has to take time to take that history. Give me the most common foods that can cause food allergies. So the most common are milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanut, tree nuts, which are like the cashews, almonds, walnuts, um, and then fish and shellfish. And does that mean that um, uh, it's unlikely that somebody has problems with strawberries or somebody has uh, uncommon to have problems with uh, other foods or, or those are just the most common? Those are just the most common. I see people with you know, yeah, fruit allergy, all uh, other sorts of things, but when you think of the most common, what we see day to day, it tends to be those that I mentioned. And in children, usually the milk and the egg and nuts. Where, when you take a history from somebody, let's talk about how we establish the diagnosis of food allergy. Uh, you said careful history, yes. uh, then what about skin testing yeah. or laboratory, what, what's available? So we typically do skin, allergy skin testing, which uh -huh. is a little scratch on the skin that leaves drops of the allergen and they'll get like an itchy mosquito bite um, and that can help diagnose the food allergy. In certain situations, I do send laboratory evaluation of food. I, we don't do screening tests for food allergy. We do tests based on history. So when we send lab work, we're sending, looking with a specific food in mind that we're questioning. Uh, if you suspect a food or if the test comes back positive, uh, does that, if an allergy test is positive to food, does that mean you're truly allergic and you're having symptoms or do you have to do avoidance and challenge? Yeah, so the positive test does not necessarily diagnose a food allergy. Now, the, the symptoms, if it's in question, we do sometimes report on oral food challenge in the clinic where we can, if the diagnosis is in question, we can give small amounts of that food in the clinic and observe. Um, uh, so typically, yeah, just getting a positive test does not itself diagnose food allergy. In the clinic, do you see a lot of people that think they're allergic to a lot of foods, we, but they're not? We, I, I do, I do. And that sort of comes back to the fact that, you know, probably at least 20% of the population thinks they have some sort of food allergy, but in fact, you know, four or 5% truly do. Uh, so a lot of intolerance and sensitivities. Uh, if somebody uh, has trouble, a child, an infant has mm -hmm. trouble with milk and they mm -hmm. have regurgitation mm -hmm. and they can't handle, mm -hmm. is that going to be a food allergy or is that going to be something else? Yeah, it, it, that typically tends to be a milk protein intolerance, it's called allergy, um, but it tends not to be. Um, although I see a lot of kids, little infants or young child, children under one or so, that have bad eczema, that certainly can be a food allergy. In a lot of instances, there is a food driving that, um, so. Is there good treatment for um, food allergy? The main treatment is avoidance. And that's what we're going to be talking about when we come back. The main treatment is avoidance, but there are other things that might be available for you and some things to protect you. But first, let's look at a young lady who has food allergies and how she handles that. We're talking with Riley Chisholm, and Riley has food allergies. Riley, your mother told me when you were a very young baby that milk spilled on your face and you broke out in hives. Do you have to avoid milk? Yeah, I do. It's it's harder at times because milk's in a lot of things and you have to really be careful about what you're um, eating. I, I've watched you uh, at the youth group in church and, and it doesn't seem to bother you when other people eat things. How hard is it to watch people uh, drink milk or eat ice cream and you don't do that? Um, it's not that hard. I mean, I've never had it, so it's not really a thing kind of jealousy thing. Yeah, so what's your favorite foods? What do you really like to eat? I love seafood. Love seafood. Uh, how about chicken? Chickens, yeah. Yeah. Uh, any, what are some of the things that you know you avoid? Um, well, all my allergies are milk, eggs, wheat, and nuts. So milk, eggs, wheat, and nuts. That's pretty hard to avoid all those, isn't it? Wheat, when you, you can't eat bread? No. And you can't eat cookies? No. And you can't eat cake? <laughs> yeah. Well, that would be pretty hard for me. Is it hard for you? It's hard. 
there's certain things I eat and certain things I stick to eating most of the time. And if when, when I stick to those things, it's not too hard. Have you ever had to use an EpiPen? No, I've never had to use an EpiPen, but I've had to use Benadryl a bunch of times. Right, good that you haven't had to use the EpiPen. Yeah. It's hard. When do you remember having to use Benadryl? What, what mistake did you make? Do you remember at all? Um, sometimes it's just I'll go to a restaurant and there will be an allergen in the food that I eat that I didn't know was in there. And, and my throat will get itchy or something like that. Or something like that. Or you, something you like that. You take that very calmly. Well, it's a really very, very important that when you're at a restaurant, do you tell people, do you tell the chef, hey, I'm allergic to these foods, be sure that I don't get them? Yeah. I mean, if I've been there a bunch and I know what I can have, usually I don't have to do that. But if it's a new restaurant that I've never been to. You know, to me, you're an amazing young girl. I watch you in church and you just do a great job and you just seem to, it doesn't bother you at all. Um, Thank you for coming to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you for talking to us about food allergies. And you stay away from eggs, wheat, milk, and nuts. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking with Dr. Megan Stauffer, board-certified allergist. We've been talking about food allergies, the difference sometimes between allergies and sensitivities. We've talked about the symptoms, the importance of a history, allergy skin testing that we can do, and then advising the patient. Megan, tell me again, let's talk about Okay, I've got peanut allergies, what should I do? The main treatment at this point really is avoidance and so it involves a lot of education, both on the part of the patient and the patient definitely has to go out and start learning about how to avoid and read labels and, and make people aware when they go to restaurants that they have a food allergy. Um, and then of course, you know, as a physician, I spend time with my patient educating them on the importance of avoidance, how to read labels, specifically what foods they need to be looking for, and then what to do, of course, if they have a reaction, teaching, you know, the treatment of acute reactions. If you tell somebody when they go to a restaurant, what do you, t- what do you how do you tell them to warn the restaurant about your food allergies? What do you have them Yeah, do? I think the most important thing is just to start with the server and make sure that your server is aware that you have a food allergy. And if, of course, if you feel like you're not getting the response or the, you know, the, the response from them that they don't feel like you're, they, you don't feel like they're taking it seriously, then, you know, may just have to leave because certainly it can be a severe problem. Sure. Is there something, uh, I guess if there probably, if you go to a restaurant and you don't trust the restaurant, there, would there be something safe that you could get? Water? <laughs> yeah, no, that's pretty much it. I think otherwise, because the risk of reading, eating in restaurants is cross-contamination. Yeah. So is that, you know, they made your dish next to a dish that contained peanuts and it's enough of, you know, using a spoon that was used in that peanut dish and using it in yours, and that could be enough to so it just takes give it a, a reaction. Small it can amount of that protein. Yeah, it to, can in to certain cause situations. A food allergy. Mm-hmm. What about schools? How do you handle children in schools as far as food allergies go? So in schools right now, they're able to keep an EpiPen. Every school's different as to how where they have to keep that pen. Now, what's, um, an, what's an EpiPen? So an EpiPen is an auto injector. It's something that you can use by yourself to inject epinephrine, which is the medication that is the only real treatment to reverse an acute, a severe allergic reaction. So if you have a severe allergic reaction to foods, or if you have a reaction, you eat uh-oh, I've got some peanuts, I'm starting to break out in hives and my lip is swelling mm-hmm. and my chest is feeling tight. Mm-hmm. Can I wait and see what happens? Yeah, no, and definitely in that situation, if it's anything more than skin symptoms and you've eaten a food you're allergic to, that absolutely epinephrine is the main treatment. So tell me about the, the types of epinephrine that's available for adults and children Mm -hmm. and the devices. Yeah, so the two main ones out there is the EpiPen, which has been around for a long time. Um, It typically comes with two pins that are hooked together so that you can have a second dose five minutes after the first if you need it. And it's very simple. You just take off a blue cap, that's a safety cap, and you just have to jab it into your leg um, in in this area here on the lateral thigh and um, count to 10 to let the medicine go in. And then as soon as you do that, you call 911. Okay. So, and when 911 comes, do you tell them, uh, I gave myself some adrenaline, I'm going to be okay, yeah. you can go back home? No, you still, go to the, you still definitely go to the emergency room. Because, because what can happen? Because it could, you know, the reaction could be very severe. It, you may need another dose, and you may need, certainly need more therapy.
Now you so. talked about the EpiPen. Mm -hmm. It's a device you take off the blue hat and you hold it into the thigh. Yeah. What's the other one? And then there's a new one called an AvaQ, which is uh, a device that actually talks to you. So you pull off a, uh, a safety cap and it, and it tells you uh, exactly where to put it and when to press and when to let go. And so it's really good in certain situations. Uh, it sounds pretty yeah. cool to do. Yeah. Do they have different doses? In other words, if you've got a, a thin, small child versus yes. an adult. Yes, uh, they both have pediatric um, lower doses and they have adult doses too. So certainly based on the weight, they get you get different pins or different. How, how fast does the epinephrine work? It usually works within two or three minutes. It's fairly immediate, um, but sometimes you will need another dose and you may need more therapy um, if you start wheezing or blood pressure decreases too. So, so it could be a pretty scary situation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's switch to another food allergy. How about the Oral allergy syndrome. There, what is that? Yeah, it's it's a unique type of food allergy. Um, it's for people who are allergic to either birch or ragweed pollen. They can actually react to eating certain fresh fruits and vegetables. So, for instance, a birch pollen allergic patient who has problems in the springtime with hay fever will oftentimes react to eating a fresh apple or cherries, and they'll get you know itchy mouth, itchy um, lips, even itchy throat. And then some people who are allergic to ragweed, which is a very common pollen in the fall, will have similar symptoms if they eat a banana or a melon. Now, is it usually a serious reaction? If somebody um, uh, has birch allergy and they eat an apple, or if somebody has ragweed and hay fever and they eat a banana or watermelon? It, yeah, it, it rarely is. There are some case reports of it becoming you know, a systemic reaction, a more severe one, but for the most part, it's limited to the mouth. And interestingly enough, they usually can eat the fruits or vegetables if they're cooked. So it's definitely, you know, a sort of unique type of food allergy. Um, do you tell the people just to avoid that food or it's okay to eat it, take some Benadryl before? Yeah, or, I typically tell do? them to avoid it. Yeah, that's um, the best thing. Yeah, right yeah. Um, other foods that can cause problems predominantly in the skin or the lungs that you deal with frequently, what would they be? Um, other foods besides the most common, certainly we do, like we, the fruits and vegetable fruits can be there. We, we've also seen some increase in sesame seed allergy, some of these, you know, newer things, um, and um, let's see, Basically, so soy it, and that sort of so thing. So it can be any it kind can of be, food, yeah. and you have to work that out by skin testing, talking to your doctor, avoiding, challenging. It must be a really difficult problem sometimes. It, it definitely can be, yeah. Sometimes it's a mystery until you get a good history and, and do the appropriate testing. I wanted to talk with, to talk with you about exercise-induced anaphylaxis that's associated with food allergy. Uh, tell me about that because it happens. It does. I've actually never seen it in my practice, but I've read about it. Uh, it is, a, it's a a severe reaction that can occur. It's anaphylaxis, which is you know a systemic type reaction that can be severe, and it only happens if somebody eats a specific food and then they exercise within two hours after eating it. There's some specific foods, celery and wheat, have been described, um, but they can you can eat the food without exercising, or you can exercise and you don't have a problem. But if you do the two in combination, it can result in an allergic type reaction. So does epinephrine uh, help with that, or you just learn, you see the doctor, they tell you what, what not to eat, yeah. not to exercise yeah. after eating. Yeah, I mean, that would be the best, is just to avoid that process. Of course, if for some reason you accidentally got the food and didn't know it and exercised, then the epinephrine, of course, would be indicated. Your advice to mothers or to people that feel like they have food allergies? You have, need to see a board-certified allergist in order to get you know appropriate history uh, and testing done. And usually, you can come out with good answers with a good advice of what to do. Yes. Megan, you're a great teacher. Thank food you. allergy is such a huge problem. It is, it and is. Thank you for coming to teach us so we'll get a better idea what to look for and who to go see. All right, thank you. Great discussion on food allergies. If you have a food that bothers you and you think it's a food allergy and you're breaking out in a rash or you have nose problems or diarrhea or your lip swells, need to see a board certified allergist to see them and they'll guide you through the proper diagnosis. Now for questions from you, the viewer, that I think are going to be important to your health, we're going to be talking about what happens to the heart during a heart attack and how do we get rid of that middle-aged bulge.
I want to thank Dr. Megan Stahl for excellent discussion on food allergies. If you've got food allergies, see your allergist. Questions from you, the viewer. Dr. Bob, what happens to the heart during a heart attack? That's really an excellent question. A lot of people really don't know. The heart's a muscle. Uh, it's just like any other muscle that we have. It's got to have a blood supply. That blood supply has to bring in oxygen to the heart muscle. If something happens to that blood supply and there's no oxygen that goes to the muscle, then the muscle's going to die. That's a heart attack. Now, let's talk about a little bit more carefully about what happens to the heart during a heart attack. We now call that acute coronary syndrome, ACS. And what we have in the coronary vessels, they're the blood vessels that supply the nourishment to the heart muscle. In those cor coronary arteries, if there is deposition of cholesterol in those arteries. Now what we used to think of is in the inner lining when there was cholesterol that was added that eventually so much would be added that it would just close off the vessel. Now we're having sort of a new thought process now that we've gotten more experience and we have better diagnostic uh, ability. That blood vessel that has the, corn the hardening of the arteries, the cholesterol in that plaque, if that little area there, there begins to implode, it will expand out all of the sudden. Something causes it to break loose. There's inflammation in there, and it's, I like to think of it as an airbag, an airbag inside a vessel, and boom, it comes out, and it completely closes off the blood supply to part of the heart. Now, that's why it's important when you and I are exercising and taking care of our heart that we know what our cholesterol is and that we get our cholesterol levels low, that we exercise so that we can get collateral circulation. What's collateral circulation? Well, if we exercise, the heart needs more blood supply, and it actually develops additional blood supply if we exercise. So if something happens, if an airbag is let loose, if a cholesterol plaque implodes, uh, then you've got the ability of collateral circulation to take over. Now, we've got a blood vessel that's completely occluded. It will cause chest pain. The electrocardiogram will be abnormal. The heart cath will show that blood vessel is blocked off. And the doctor can come in, and the doctor can actually open up that vessel. If he can do that within 90 minutes, then we can reestablish the blood flow to the heart. Nothing happens. If he can't, if it lasts six hours or five hours or four hours, then the heart muscle hasn't had enough blood and that heart muscle will die. When it dies, the rest of the heart still works, but it makes it where it doesn't work as good. And so you have to be followed by your doctor and your heart specialist. So that's what happens during acute coronary syndrome. How do we prevent that? Watch our weight, watch our cholesterol, watch our blood pressure. Question number two, Dr. Bob, <laughs> cute question. Uh, how do I prevent middle age spread? Terribly important question because we know that people in their 20s, if they're overweight, their chances of having problems secondary to being more overweight in their 40s will be in existence and the chances of getting heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, strokes, heart attacks are much, much, much greater, eight times as much as somebody that starts off without being overweight. Now, when you get middle-aged, let's think about an athlete that's running up and down a basketball court all of the time. He's running so much that he can eat more food, but if he stops running, then he has to eat less food to keep his weight stable. As we get in our middle age, sometimes we forget our tennis shoes. We forget to be active. We forget to take an, a walk every morning or when we get home from work that we need to take a walk. So the first thing that we need to do to prevent or to get rid of the middle age bulge in our tummies for both men and women See your doctor, get a heart check, know what your cholesterol is, but start that exercise and then start eating properly. Let your doctor guide you on the program 
of how much activity and let him guide you on how you've done on losing weight. It's such an important thing for your longevity, for your ability to live a normal, happy life. So you remember that middle-aged bulge, probably because you're not exercising enough and eating too much. Now, uh, that's all the time that we have for this show. Remember those things that we like to do, and those are exercise. How much exercise? Well, we need to be exercising 45 minutes, and we need to do it five, six, seven days a week. It can be walking, working in the garden, riding a bicycle, swimming, find somebody, exercise with them. Just be active for that period of time. Eat properly. That's more fruits and more vegetables. Why? They've got antioxidants. They don't have the fat, greasy foods that turn into the cholesterol. Eat less red meat. Eat more baked food. Eat good food. And eat less of it. We have a good time eating. Look at your plate before you start, start eating and say, now how much does my tummy really need? And it really doesn't need very much. Get eight hours of sleep. If you get eight hours of sleep, you'll be happy. You'll work better. People around you will uh, notice that something's going on, that you're happier and you've got a lot more energy. So get those eight hours of sleep. And most of all, what do we like in the Dr. Bob Show? Is that laughter in your life. Find people that you laugh with, stay happy, and turn up. You'll be healthy.